So, welcome to those who have traveled from near and far in order to come to class. There's somebody who gets the clear prize this morning for traveling, for traveling the, fur- the furthest to get here. So, what we're going to talk about, first of all, is Parshat Karach. Second thing, what we're going to do, at least on a certain level, is going to be similar to what we did last time in the sense that I'm starting really at the end of the Parsha, and then we're going to work backwards and figure out what else, you know, wh- where things were coming from. So let me restate that. There is what happens that we could look at as being like kind of like the end or an aftermath, but I think that that's really the right place to begin, and then we're going to see hopefully something a little bit broader. In source number one, which again is after the whole episode, really. By the way, that itself is really bad. Because again, even though the Korach, specifically the Korach episode, has ended, which or been neutralized, Korach has been neutralized, on the 250, nonetheless, we have all this complaining which is taking place, and God is saying, I'm going to swallow them up in a moment. But you blow up him. William Moshe Aaron, and this is interesting. Again, there always could be between the lines where God says to Moshe, then Moshe says to Aaron. But nonetheless, the way it's presented, Moshe says to Aaron, "Kacha tamachta v'tena la eish me alam isbeach v'sim ktoret v'holich mehera el ha'ida v'kaper alehim ki yatsa ketzav milufnei Hashem achal hanagef." The use of the ktoret here, the incense, is interesting because that's probably one of the things we need to do is to follow the incense. If we work a little bit backwards, Moshe had said to the 250, well, why don't you take incense and let's see how that works out. Now, the reason to be somewhat suspicious that it wasn't going to work it out that well is that the Torah previously had been used by Nadav and Avihu, and that causes their death. Now, there was an episode of the, where it's mentioned afterwards, although episode may, may not be the right word, because the Torah was mentioned in terms of the service of the Avoda of the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippur, where he's told to take the Torah and go Lefnaiv Lefnim, go to the inner sanctum, which then itself may inform the episode of Nadav Naviyu. Perhaps that's what they were trying to do, was to behave like the Kohen Gadol, but that itself then helps us because behaving like a Kohen Gadol and taking the Torah when you're undeserving because you're not the Kohen Gadol is something which does not bring about life, rather it brings about death. And therefore, Moshe saying to them, well, just take the Ketoret is either because Moshe wants to kill all of them, which is the way that some people could read it and maybe the way that they took it, or is Moshe essentially saying to them, well, you know this is not going to work out, so please don't do this unless these people really believe that for some reason they're supposed to be the Kohanim, which is actually the part of all of this that I don't want to get into as much, but what I will try to figure out is what happened before and what happened after. Let's, we're moving towards the after, so let's continue. The other thing is that Moshe says is that you're going to take this in order to bring about kapara, which means essentially what he's telling Aaron is go act like a Kohen, go act like the Kohen or Kohen Gadol, and bring about atonement for the people because the because the plague has already begun. So just like Moshe had said before, go mehira. Here we have Aaron running. He puts the incense and he brings about atonement. Aaron there represents the, the difference between where life and death is. He stands between and he stops the plague from going further. 14,700 people died. Milvad, other than 250 or 253 people, Hamitim al Dvarkorach. And then it tells us again more emphasis, Aaron returns, and the plague has ended. But then the text continues. And, and it's at this point that we're now going to have a mate competition. Each one's going to write their name on their particular staff. So this time, and every time we have the tribes mentioned in the book of Bamidbar, you need to pay attention who's included, who's excluded. So at this point, we have 12 tribes, including Levi, which means Ephraim and Menashe are really one as Yosef, and therefore Levi is represented against the other 11, and Aaron's name is written. 
V'nachtem ba'ol moed l'fnei ha'edut asher iva'ed lachem shama. And you're going to place them inside the edut, where it's really the place of testimony. V'yai isha asher evchar ba'ol mateu yifrach. And the one who's chosen, their, their uh, staff will somehow, it will blossom. Again, God continues, and this is somehow going to, or hopefully, stop all the complaining that's been done. But to be Moshe ben Israel, and Moshe then conveys this message to a love called Nesim. Mate le nasiyachad, mate le nasiyachad, le vetavotam, shnei masar matot, mate aron betoch. So then again, as I said before, the number is 12. There are 12 altogether, and one of the 12 is Aaron's, and therefore all 12. Moshe takes them in Pasuk of Vet, Veinach Moshe to Matel of Nei Hashem, Ba'olei Edut, and they're all placed, as it were, in front of God in the tent of, uh, of meeting. Ve'yimim Achrat, and then on the next day, Ve'yavo Moshe Elohel Ahidut, V'nei Parach Mate Aaron, Levet Levi, and on the next day, Aaron's staff has in fact blossomed, again, identifying or signifying specifically to the tribe of Levi, or the house of Levi. Vayetse perach, and a flower comes out as it blossoms. Vayetse tzitz v'yigomel shkedim. And this turn of phrase, Vayetse tzitz, is interesting. We're going to come back to it, and I'm not going to translate it now. V'yigmol shkedim, and the next thing you know that not only has flowers come, but now the flowers have developed into fruit, and the fruit that it has are almonds. Vayetse Moshe Et kol hamatot mepnei Hashem el kol bnei Yisrael v'yuvichu ish mateyu. And Moshe brings out all the staffs. They're all looking. They'll see, and each one takes their staff. A yomer shal Moshe hashevet mateyu Aaron lepnei edut, and then return the staff of Aaron lemishmeret to be as a it should be guarded there laot as a sign lepnei Mary as a sign for the children who are rebellious. But techelt lenotam me alai v'loyemutu. And that should be the end of all their complaints, and then they won't die again as this aftermath to all of these complaints. Vayas Moshe Kasher, Siva Hashem Otoke Nasa, and Moshe did as God commanded. The people's response is actually completely tragic because instead of cheering everybody up, and now we have an end to this, but rather we have the following Vayomu Bnei Israel Moshe Lemor, Hin Gavanu, Avadnu, Kulanu, Avadnu. Kola Kareva Kareva Mishkan Hashem. Yamut ha'im tamnu lugvoa. We're dead. We're lost. We're all lost. Whoever comes close to the Mishkan is uh, is going to die. Everyone's going to die. We're just surrounded by death. So you so you have over here the takeaway at the end is one which is just so absolutely devastating, and part of it is I, I would even call it a fear of the holy because that's the way that they're articulating it, and and it's at this point that we need to think we need to think in a much broader sense but l- l- let's start with really uh, what, what should be the obvious and again I, I don't know how how broad and how wide to go right now but just if we continue from last week's parasha in last week's parasha they all receive a death sentence and if they all receive a death sentence then apparently they're all going to die and that that is going to then generate some kind of a uh, dissatisfaction with the leadership and some kind of suggestion by some that perhaps we need two new type of leadership, new type of religious leadership, new type of, uh, of uh, political, military, whatever it may be. We can understand those, uh, those feelings or that combination, but nonetheless, all of that doesn't seem to work. And, and again, if we, would read, if we would spend time reading carefully the beginning of the Parsha, the rebellion of Korach on the one hand and Datan and Avir on the other hand, and where the 250 stand, and it's quite possible that one is a religious and the other is a political rebellion. And what happens over here is that what Korach succeeds in doing is to gather together a whole group of the disenfranchised and the disenchanted, and he gathers them together as, uh, you know, it, it's the all anti Moshe squad. So let, let's get them all together, even though they're all coming from different places. And ultimately, that group which has emerged probably never could have worked things out among themselves. Midrashically, the one who really understands this is probably Owen's wife, 
who just sees the through this facade because it's not a logical point. But when you realize that they're all perhaps anti, and I think it's very easy for us today to understand such things. But n- n- nonetheless, that's that's a part of it. But but death over here at this point, you know, death is unfortunately always inevitable. But it's more inevitable over here because it's not just that it's inevitable; it's that they're not going to get to the place that they would love to believe that they're supposed to get to. And then this uh, this movement which had begun and apparently the 250 people are convinced by their own they they believe their own literature they believe their own press they believe that they really can approach the Mishkan and they'll have some kind of different types of responses and again I want to point out the absurdity of all of that and I don't know what Moshe was thinking when Moshe said just take the Torah I would love to believe that Moshe is using this as a ploy to stop them from doing it but they don't stop they proceed and that's part of the problem but now the response is well look how devastating and, and destructive the Mishkan is and it is, it, it's something which is, is going to, we're all going to die, which is really interesting that the Mishkan is being blamed. But you give me a couple of minutes, and I, I want to be able to come back to this. But, but first, I want to continue a little bit further, because I think that there are some consequences to all of this that we don't necessarily pay attention to, and we don't necessarily see it moving in this you know, specific direction. This and again, it and it is. It, it really is completely straight, and it's, it's something which I think is very easy to miss. In Parsha Chukat, in next week's Parsha, and again we have the first part, which is essentially a law which is used. And again, anytime there's law found in the book of. Bamidbar, we always need to ask what is the interaction between the law and the narrative, and that law which is introduced is a law of response to death. Right? Chukat, paraduma, and how do you respond to death, and how do you get healed from death, and how are you allowed to re-enter in a holy space after being involved in death, which is so much more interesting when you realize what's being articulated over here, because over here there is death all around us, and the holy week, week meaning this is, sounds much more of an emotional and a religious response, but it's interesting that then there's the religious response, which gets plugged in right afterwards. And then we move over to the next episode. And it's an episode which is just going to continue with this theme of death. I mean, Parsha Chukos is all about death, the ones which are revealed deaths and the hidden deaths. The hidden deaths, of course, is that 38 years have gone by and all the complaining people have now passed away. And now we have this new generation. But, we, but we're going to pick up in source number two, which is... First, the death of Miriam, right in the beginning. Miriam passes away. The people all start complaining. I love the horrific Midrash that tells us that Moshe and Aaron are sitting Shiva for their sister at this point when all the people start complaining for the lack of water. And Moshe sees them, and Aaron sees them. They both read the crowd differently. Moshe think, Aaron thinks it's so wonderful that they're coming to comfort the people. And Moshe says, this is, not a, this is a mob. This is not a people who are coming to uh, comfort. These are people coming to complain. But nonetheless, God then says in that episode, Go and take the staff. Now, of course, there's a little bit of tension. Whose staff is this? Is this Moshe's staff? Is this Aaron's staff? But I, I, I do want to point out that the last thing we just now saw is that Aaron's staff was taken and put away as a symbol. The other thing was is that used in terms of rebellious children, and we've noted this before, and there are others who've noted this as well, but if we continue and you look at Pasuk Ted, V'kach Moshe Tamatei Milifnei Hashem, Right, and that's the one that was placed the Fnei Hashem, the one of Aaron. Listen, rebellious people, which is exactly what was said when that when the, that one was put away. That this should be assigned for rebellious people. So that's what they said. And they go and whatever, if you want to call it a sin, whatever happens, happens. And God's response is that that's it. That you're not going to be leading the people. Pasuk Yitbet. And you're not continuing. You, you, you have ended your mission. And very soon afterwards, I mean, that's Pasuk Yudbet, Pasuk Kafdalit already is. 
that God says that you'll take Aaron up to the mountain. Yosef Aaron alamav ki lo yavola aretz asher natati levnei Yisrael aloshem iritim et pi levnei mira kachet Aaron take Aaron and then the next thing that you have take off his clothing and give the clothing over to his son and vayifshem oshet Aaron et begadav yibashotam et elazar beno vayamat and then Aaron dies and and again I just want to pause here for a second because. You know, we would have thought when we read this week's parsha by itself that everything worked out okay, essentially. You have the threat of Korach, and then you have Aaron wins, and then it's not that everyone lives happily ever after. It's not that if you want your Zionist twist on it, and then they make their way to Eretz Israel and they build the Beit HaMikdash, and everyone lives happily ever after. The people still wander around the desert for a while, but that's it. We're spared of all that. We're not told of those other things that happen at this point. Just time goes by. Time goes by essentially silently, and the next thing you, that you know is that Miriam dies. Then very quickly afterwards, Aaron dies, and then there's this thing in the middle about Aaron dying. So I'm just pointing out that thematically, the death of Aaron is far more connected to what we just now read than I think that we normally would understand. And it, I, I think one way to articulate this, which is a way I don't like, but we'll look for a better way of saying it: if you were the type of people that really um, identify with something which is called an Ayin Hara. Aaron got an Ayin Hara over here. They don't want Aaron, right? They don't want him as Cohen. They want him to be replaced. And guess what happens? Aaron gets replaced. Now, again, all of you can tell me, yeah, but 38 years went by till he's replaced. And I'm going to say, yeah, but it's the next Parsha. It's what's told right afterwards. I want to know what's the article in Haaretz right afterwards when they write about Aaron's death. Do they go back with a little bit of snark? I don't have any other word right now. In order to go back and say, oh, you know, Aaron, the one who was attacked, you know, just, you know, that's the last, that's actually the last conversation that we had. And he was attacked and it was, and it was the ark and, and it was the staff. And then the staff is the one which proved his superiority. And now that same staff is used in order to, be misused in order to actually to end his career and it was supposed to be used as a protection or as a sign against those who rebel and now those who rebel actually are being told that you're rebellious and God sticks to the rebellious and leaves Aaron and Moshe on the side. I'm just saying is that if you read these partial together which of course we we tend never to do but if you read these partial together it suddenly takes upon itself a uh, completely different type of a texture to it because instead of having a situation where Aaron is completely victorious and Moshe is victorious over here and all the attacks that are waged against Aaron in this week's parsha are just swept away and Aaron wins and so on, well, for how long is Aaron's victory? And again, you're going to tell me it's for 38 years and I'm going to say, yeah, but then, you know that, that's not really spelled out in any place and just look how the Torah immediately afterwards goes to this other episode where it shows, no, that's going to stop. The, the other thing that I want you to note, because it's something which is very easy to completely ignore, and that is the, the use of the description of the clothing over here. And again, you, you wouldn't have noticed anything about it, even though there was at least one hint that we uh, so easy to miss. But there's something else going on. It has to do with the clothing. And that is, well, eventually, you know, Aaron's clothing gets replaced. I mean, it gets taken off of him. It gets poured on somebody else. So therefore, who is the real... Co- if I'm going to just say, in Parsha, Korach and Chukat, which again is unfair to read them together. I think there are some years that they are read together, by the way, in some... Uh, not in Israel. Uh, the, the Korach and Chukat could be read together, I think. I don't remember. You know you know what? Sometimes people ask me about Hechsherim in America. And I say, I don't know. I don't live there. I don't live there. I don't. I don't know. And I said, and tell your, ask your local Orthodox rabbi, but also ask him at the same time not to comment on any hechsherim or laws of shemitah that could take place in Eretz Yisrael. I said, let's be, uh, let, 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 let's let's agree upon that. I remember a couple of years ago, a couple we were just trying to figure out when they said Yizkar, if it was on Shemini Atzeres or Simchas Torah, and nobody, nobody was able to remember, and uh, say Baruch Hashem, I know Reb Zera fasted for many, many days to forget everything that he learned in, uh, in Bavel, and all of us forgot without fasting at all. Anyway, getting back to the point, but I'm saying when you read Korach and Chukah together, I'm not saying you do, but if you read Korach and Chukah together and say, so who's the real Kohen? You, you end up at least with a real interesting answer, and what's that? El Azar. 
I mean, he's not the one who you thought was in contention at all. But look, the fact that it's Aaron and then a Ben Aaron and then it's Aaron's family, so that ultimately means that Aaron is uh, victorious. By the way, another subtext to all of this is found in the Midrash of why was Korach so convinced? And it says because of Bnei Korach. And we have a whole bunch of Tehillim which are authored by Bnei Korach who are very, very respected Levium, not, not Kohanim. So therefore, moving forward, you know, who actually wins? So if Korach somehow some kind of understanding about the future, I don't know how to explain that. So who, who, who actually wins at the end? Well, the answer is El Azar wins, which means by extension, Aaron wins. But I just want to point out, because there is that dramatic moment where Aaron goes up the mountain dressed with the clothing of the Kohen Gadol, but El, El Azar comes down from the mountain, who is now wearing the clothing of the, of the Kohen Gadol. El Azar is now wearing the clothing of the of the Kohen Gadol. So therefore, in that wonderfully dramatic scene, you now have, again, in a certain sense, the baton, over here it's the mate, being, being passed on from one to the other, but it's that moment of clothing. I'm just going to, again, stress, is a little bit more important than sometimes we notice. And in order to do that, as I said, we just have to go a little bit broader than we would have thought. But, but first of all, this idea which is expressed about the fear of the holy, right, in and of itself is really interesting because a fear of holiness is an admission that there is something holy in the world. Because generally the attack against holiness is going to be a denial of holiness, a denial, a denial that there's something which is different, something which is set off, something which is special. So therefore, the acknowledgement of holiness itself is interesting, but nonetheless, over here, it has developed into a fear. Now, that fear is interesting, but it's understandable. Why is there a fear of holiness over here? Because look at all the people and you know, trying to come near the Mishkan, trying to serve, trying to be Kohanim, and look what happens, and... And they're all devastated. Again, that's at least the third or fourth time I've used that word. And all of them have had this response. So now keeping in mind about this fear of the holy, I, I want to go backwards and start to think about where we see it. By the way, you could tell me that the first time we see it is actually Moshe by the burning bush. That Moshe sees, understands that this is the burning bush and recoils from this. You could, for that matter, you can claim that it's Yaakov when he wakes up from his dream and says, oh, there is, you know, how awesome is this place? God is in this place. By the way, there, there is at least midrashically maybe more a commonality between those two places because Yaakov is said to be the place that one day the Beit HaMikdash is going to stand. And Moshe obviously is the place, not midrashically, is obviously the place that Matan Torah is going to be. Midrash there is a connection between Har Sinai and Har Hamoriah, so much so that in one articulation, I've said this many, many times, is that God separated the way that you would separate Chala min Ha'isa, God separated Chala from Har Sinai, sorry, from Har Hamoriah and placed it in the desert, and therefore somehow Sinai becomes the Mishkan and then the Mishkan goes back to Eretz Israel and then the Mishkan turns into the Beit HaMikdash and that itself is seen in the sense of returning back to its organic whole to the place that it was supposed to be in from the very beginning. But nonetheless, you see at least, you know, sometimes this recoil from something which is holy, but let me go more recently and not as easily understood and that's in source number three. Now, this immediately afterwards... They just received the death sentence, right? That was uh, Perak Yud Gimel and Yudalud and Meraglim. Yudalud, they're told about the death sentence. And then afterwards, you had what we discussed last week, those who anyway decided to pursue and try to go into Eretz Yisrael, and they're killed. And then, and then we find over here a couple of mitzvot were given, which is interesting. And then we're told about another almost random narrative we don't we don't know why it's here. We don't know when it happened. We don't know anything else about it. But rather, it says the following: For you, Bnei they were in the desert. Now, the desert's a big place. And they were in the desert a long time, and there went lots of places in the desert. And a person is mikoshesh. Now, the word mikoshesh actually it could mean gathering, but the way that it's phrased is mikoshesh. It sounds like he continually is mikoshesh. It's not one. And, and that leads the rabbis to say that they come and they see him and they tell him stop and he won't stop. He's mikoshesh. He keeps on being mikoshesh. The yekrivo oto hamotzim oto mikoshesh etzim. And they come close and they go over and they, and they say and they 
and they bring him over. El Moshe vel Aaron v'kola ida v'inichot over mishpar, and they place him inside. They 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 arrest him, put him outside of prison. Kilo parash mayaselok. They don't know what to do with him. Now, why they don't know what to do with him is not that clear. The Gemara goes into a bit of a discussion that maybe they don't know what to do with him because uh, the. They don't know what Isser he did. And there's a whole discussion in the Gemara. Which law of Shabbat did he break? And it's obvious to them that he must have broken some law of Shabbat. Now, you know, the, the Mishnah says that in, in the time that there was a high court, almost no, no one was ever killed. And, and I'll tell you the most basic reason. I mean, I, I know that Rabbi Kiva says once in 70, and right, there's all the ones, 70 years or no one would ever, Rabbi Kiva says no one would ever be killed. But why? So Rabbi Kiva talks about how he, of course, examined the witnesses. But I'll, I'll tell you another point. In order to be guilty, you need to be warned. And then after you're warned, you need to accept it. Which means anybody who really wanted to break a law, why don't you just break it before you're warned? And when you're warned, you're stopped. You stop. I mean, why in the world would anybody pursue breaking the law once they're warned? I mean, you'd have to be crazy, which, which, by the way, means that you can get anybody off on reasons of insanity because why are they keeping on doing this after they were warned? I mean, it's, it's just, it, it seems completely insane. And I want to go back into what's noted by the Gemara over here. He's Mick Koshe, she doesn't stop. So apparently they warn him and he keeps on doing it. By the way, in order to warn somebody properly, you also have to tell them exactly what the Isser is, you know, how specific you need to be. And I'll, and I'll say it again, the Gemara tries to figure out which of the Lamatet Melachot he possibly did. Okay, So I want to suggest that there may be something else, and what I'm going to say is based upon Tosvot and based upon a, uh, a Midrash that Tosvot quotes, and then we'll see, we may get to someplace much more interesting, including an impossible question of the Marsha, which I brought. Tosvot, which is in source number four, tells us, and, and by the way, there's a whole other Gemara where Rabbi Akiva says, oh, the Makoshes was Slavchad. And then an, another Tana responds and says, Rabbi Akiva, you're going to have to pay the price for this. If the Torah do, you know, doesn't tell us his name, what right do you have to reveal what his name is? So that's part of where Tosvot is coming from here. So he writes, near the Rajba. Now, by the way, when Tosvot cites the Rajba, it's not our favorite Rajba. This is actually the Rashmi Shans. The Rosh Mishans was one of the Balei Tosfot that ended up moving to Eretz Yisrael, and his proper name is, I wrote for you, Rabbi Shimshon ben Avraham Mishans, actually one of the later Balei Tosfot. Uh, a lot of the Tosfot that we have printed in the Gemara is from him or his school. Near the Raj, but the Savr lo commanded Amar Tzlavchad. Hainu Mekoshesh, that Tzlavchad was Mekoshesh. Umasa Mekoshesh, it was a, and it was in the beginning of the 40 years. Miyad Acher Masem Raglim, and it happens immediately after Meraglim, which, by the way, is the, is the place that it's found in the Torah. The Amar B'Midrash, because it says in the Midrash, the L'Shem Shamayim Nitzkaven, because the Mekoshesh, according to this, is L'Shem Shamayim. Now, what does it mean that he's L'Shem Shamayim? So he continues and explains, Shahayu Omrim Yisrael, Kevin Shenigzer Aleim Shaloli Kanes Laaretz, Bima Semiraglim, that once it was stated that they can't go into Eretz Yisrael because of the Miraglim, Shuv Ein Mechuyavim Be Mitzvot. We, we have no obligation for any Mitzvot. Amad Vechilo Shabbat, Kedesh Reg Virocherim. He broke Shabbat so that people would know, no, there still are mitzvot. There's still are consequences to our behavior. By the way, the best, the best reference that I was able to think about this, which I'm not going to quote for you, but I'll just tell you that you can go and look up yourselves, is an episode of The Twilight Zone called Escape Clause. Anyway, it was aired on November 6, 1959 on CBS. And uh, essentially, it was a, a, it was a story about a man who ends up making a deal with the devil, and part of the deal is that he'll never die. And then, but, but then life isn't exciting anymore. So he keeps on doing more and more absurd things. Finally, he tries to jump down and he ends up, his wife ends up trying to stop him and she ends up falling and he pleads guilty to a murder he never committed and then he's sentenced to life in prison. So, which, uh, you remember. So, so this whole attitude that life has lost its meat, what? That life is, so this, this idea that life has lost its meaning and that nothing you do means anything anymore, is essentially, again, I'm not telling you that Tosfot has watched the Twilight Zone as a kid, or that the Rashmi Shans is, but what but he, but he's saying is that that's where, the, that, that is really where, where he says Tzlavchad is coming from, that everyone is saying, oh, it doesn't make a difference anymore. There's nothing, we're all, death, we're, we're all on death row. We're all on death row at this point, and death is pervasive, death is all around, and he says, 
Well, life does make a difference. As a matter of fact, if you break Shabbat, then you're going to pay the consequences. So now the Marsha asks an impossible question, and that is in source number five. He says that if that's the case, at the very end he says... In the second line, the second line, he says, but if that's the case, then he shouldn't have been guilty because it's what it's called the Malach Hashem Tzrich Lagufa. He didn't do it because we need the problem on Shabbat is Malach Machshavet. But if you're doing it in order to prove a point to someone else, it's no longer you're doing it because you want to break Shabbat. You're doing it because you want to prove so it's Malach Hashem Tzrich Lagufa. It's Malach Hashem Tzrich Lagufa. He should not be guilty. It, it, it becomes it becomes a whole different category of law. But I do want to say maybe that's why they didn't know what to do with him. Here he is publicly desecrating the Shabbat, but he's not. But technically, he's not breaking the Shabbat. So now, what do you do? He's not guilty of one of the lamitet melachot because he's not doing it in order to do the melacha. That's a side point. He's doing it to show everybody. But once he's doing it to show everybody, it's no longer the reason. By the way, Ravad Yosef has a tshuva. This is something which a lot of people, a lot of posts, for whatever reason, have difficulties with. What if? Uh, let's just put it like this: We break Shabbat to save a Jewish life. Right? Why? Because you say break one Shabbat and then they'll keep many Shabbatot. What if it's a non Jewish life? Now, six days of the week, there's no question. Seventh day of the week, now the rabbis in Europe came to an, a consensus that you break Shabbat. Why? Because it's not, it, it's because of a larger macro consideration and you break Shabbat for a non Jew as well, without getting into any of the details. Ravovadia, who cites this and says, but he never saw it inside, he knows that the rabbis claim that that's the case. He says, but anyway, when you break Shabbat, we'll go back to Haaretz now, when you break Shabbat, what should you have in mind, to, to save life, what should you have in mind? I'm not doing it because I want to do the malacha, I'm doing it so I shouldn't be on the front page of Haaretz tomorrow morning. <laughs> so he says, that turns it into malacha, and then it's no longer breaking Shabbat on a Torah level. So if you, if, you, if you realize that, and you go back to this Mikoshesh over here, the Mikoshesh is doing this because he wants to prove a point, so then, why, then he's not guilty of Shabbat. And I'll say to himself, that may be the reason why no one knows what to do, because did he break Shabbat? He didn't break Shabbat. He won't stop breaking Shabbat, but he's doing it for a different reason. He's doing it for, which I just now created a whole technical problem that the Achronim can all deal with, which once all the Achronim deal with, you know it can't be shot. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you should all be amused. And you can, you can use this. You can ask anybody this question. Why was he guilty if according to Tosva? Again, it's the Marcho's question. So I'm answering the Marcho's question. That's exactly the point. But what are we up to then? We're up to this sense of everyone that we are now devoid of holiness. And, but, but again, I want to understand that. Why are we devoid of holiness? Because we were at this apex. We were at our Sinai, right? Something really significant happened, and, and we're on the way to the land of Israel, and now we're no longer on the way to Israel. Now we're wandering around, and now we're all lost. So this sense of abandonment, even if you're going to tell me that it's temporary, this sense that, that we are no longer special, that we are no longer chosen, that we are no longer... We're no longer the focus of the story. We're just now wandering around aimlessly until we all die is something which seems to be pervasive, and that's what he tries to... No, life still is significant, and there's still things... And again, if you need any more insight, then you have to go back to that episode of The Twilight Zone. Coming back to what happens immediately afterwards is interesting because then we go in... Well, and instead of saying what happens afterwards, what happens afterwards I know is significant because a number of the commentaries can't seem to ignore it. But let, let, let's do it the other way around. Let, let's go to the next week's Parsha, right? The, which is us, which is where we start today, which is really the beginning of Korach, which is where we didn't start today. Source number six, V'yikach Korach ben Yitzar ben Kahat ben Beli v'dev d'avirun b'nei Eliyav on v'pel b'nei Ruvain v'yakumul f'nei now, what's the problem? The problem is Vayikach Korach. What does he take? You, you have a dangling Vayikach. Vayikach Korach, what does he take? So the Targum completely ignores the problem and reinterprets the word Vayikach, and he says, Vayit Paleg Korach. He, what did he take? He took within him a desire to create a machloket. It Paleg is a plukta, plukta is an argument, and he says, and, and, and everything he does is not the point. The point is, he wants a fight. Yes, you have people like this. He wants a fight. So what does he take? 
He, 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 he takes upon himself to start a fight, and therefore he translates this dangling vayikach, vayikach karach, karach. Now, now, by the way, that's not what the word vayikach means, and it's a bit of a stretch, but I know why he does this. The Targum Yonatan in Source 8, it says vayikach, and I, this is the Hebrew translation, and you'll see you know, what he fills in here, and you should be familiar with this. Vayikach talito shakulo tchelet. He took a talit, which is called tchelet. Now, you all know this already. And this also goes back to what I skipped. What happens after the makoshesh? We moved into the point of tzitzit. And once again, the same question always will come back in Bamidbar. What is that particular mitzvah doing at this particular point? And now we notice that at least someone is saying, well, there's linkage over here, because whatever happens at the beginning of Karach has been informed by whatever happens right then at the end of Parshat Shlach. Rashi goes along the same lines. Now, Rashi has a little bit more trouble, and he's, again, it's a longer Rashi. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Vayikach Korach, lakachet atzmo l'tzad echad, liyot nechlak mitoch eda. So you realize he went really more in the tune of the Targum, of the Targum Onkelos. A couple lines down, he goes on, kach et, it's kach et aron. We'll go even much further. Towards the end, he says, he brings the other Midrash that says, amur lo talit shakulo shel optura, and therefore he takes, what does he take? So then you just go back to what we're reading immediately beforehand, was tzitzit, and therefore you almost read it as a, go, as a run-on sentence. We were talking about take tzitzit, you know, you should take the tzitzit, and then he takes the tzitzit, which means there really is no line of division between shlach and karach, and again, that seems to be the way that they're reading it. Um, the Rashbam goes in a different direction, but you know, Kamova Yikach Avram et Sarah, and and I'm not therefore Yikach Korach Vedaton Vir and Anashim Harbe, and therefore they took they gathered this whole group together. Now, Rashi, we're going to come back to this soon. Rashi, right afterwards, they claim what's their big thing? They say Kulam Ktoshim, we're all holy, and Rashi points out, well, when do they become holy? We all stood by Sinai, and we all had that religious experience. Now, one of the things that I want to stress is that I just now gave this whole argument based upon the Mekoshesh, how they may have felt as if they've been diffused from holiness, as if the holiness has somehow been lost, that instead of holiness, they've been sentenced to death. And the, quite the opposite has taken place. And something happens over here which turns that around. So give me a couple seconds. But in, or, in order to answer that, we need to ask ourselves one question. And that is, what is the significance of the midst of tzitzit? And then again, why is it placed right over here? So I'm going to point out that there is something about the midst of tzitzit, which is not necessarily the first thing that one will think about. There's something about it which actually will help with the identification of what it is. Okay, I'll explain exactly what I mean. Normally, based upon Vayikra, ironically in Parshat Kedoshim, it says that one is not allowed to wear wool and linen, which is together, which means that there is a prohibition of what's called shatnes. There's an exception to shatnes, and that is that tzitzit, you're allowed to put wool and linen together. That is specifically when it, you have the tchelet. The tchelet, it has to do with the dye, and, the, and, and I'm not going into any more details, but when you wear tzitzit, which are tchelet, then you are permitted to wear wool and linen together. Now, there is another example where one can wear wool and linen together, which is actually the key to all of this, and that is the clothing of the Kohen. So now look what just now happened. God tells us all that we should be wearing tzitzit. By the way, keep in mind the word tzitzit. We should be wearing tzitzit, and when we wear tzitzit, then you can even wear woolen together, which essentially is making a really interesting argument. And what is it? That you are a mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh. Not just the kohanim, but all of you are. Now, if all of you are melechet kohanim v'goy kadosh, so now what does that midrash mean that Korach takes, takes the tchelet or takes the, the tzitzit and, and places it and read kulo tchelet? We are all kulo tchelet. We are all kohanim. We are all kulam kadoshim. That's exactly the argument that it makes, which I'm saying, where did that argument come from? So again, just follow the flow. We're all holy. 
we feel we get the death sentence, we feel we lost the holiness, and therefore the Makoshesh becomes this really interesting story in the middle over here, where he tries to show, no, we still have holiness, we still have obligations, we still have to keep mitzvot, and then right afterwards we get this mitzvah of tzitzit, in or, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, but this is how delusional I am. I'm saying this as pshat in the Torah, as pshat in the Torah. Why is the mitzvah of tzitzit placed over here in order to say that that all Jews are a mamlechet kohenim v'goy kadosh? And if we're all mamlechet v'goy kadosh, what is going to be the immediately response of somebody who's a little bit cynical and a little bit jealous and feels a little bit displaced? And who knows how his mother treated? We always have to blame the mother. And who knows how he was treated as a kid? And now Korach wakes up and says, "Well, if that's the case, then." we're all holy. And if we're all holy, we should all be Kohanim, which I'm just, I'm just trying to point out that that argument of Korach does not come in a vacuum. Just read the Chomish in front of you. So I have a really nice piece over here, which I really didn't expect to read, by Rav Soloveitchik in Shirim Lezech Avimari on Klein B'Tzitzit, where he goes a little bit into the analysis. He doesn't go as far as uh, I just now went with you, but what he does do over here is he starts pointing out you know, the whole problem about the idea of that the tzitzit have climbed. Part of the question that he deals with is what he identifies as the sheet of the of the of the rived is is a person when they're not fulfilling the mitzvah. For example, it's night and you're sleeping at night and you're still wearing tzitzit and it has klayim, or you're allowed to do it, which means while you're fulfilling the mitzvah, perhaps. But, and by the way, and then he says, oh, what about a kohen who's not in service? Can he wear the klayim? So th- this parallel between the tzitzit and klayim, the tzitzit and big day kahuna are really interesting. By the way, now go back to what we already noted, what happens by next week's parasha. The big day Kohen of Aaron gets taken off and gets handed over to his son. So that, I'm saying, again, is much more interesting than we realized because we didn't, we didn't notice there's a clothing issue over here, right? We didn't realize there's clothing, but of course we should have noticed why, because the end of last week's parsha is really the, intro, the introduction to this week's parsha, and next week's parsha is really a continuation of this week's parsha, and therefore, again, things are a little bit broader and a little bit more interesting than I think that we noticed. Just to move on a little bit, again, where does it say, Kadosh? that's in source 13, that is when we stood at Sinai. And that whole section over here is full of something which we now should be able to identify. What is it? It's the fear of the holy. Right? And, and then God says to Moshe, tell the people to move away from the mountain so a lot of people don't die. Which means what's being played out now with the Mishkan actually had a parallel before with Sinai itself, and which of course goes back to the Ramban's general and greater point about how the Mishkan itself is a continuation of Sinai. But this point of the fear and then the point of the potential of people dying actually is what's being played over here. And, you know, if, if I would possibly be able to say things like chiastic structures and so on between books, I would point this out, but I'm not. I, I don't go. You know, I, I don't roll that way. So you, you know that I'm not going to... Uh, I, I, yeah, we don't, I don't roll on Shabbos either. Wow. All, all these cultural references today. So, as I said, that, that, that itself... Is, uh, is interesting. Right afterwards, in the next chapter, is where the people, again, are afraid. They move away. Right? And they start, and, and they're shaking. And they say to Moshe, you know, you go. <laughs> right? We could die. You go. Which itself is where things also, we don't realize at the time, things are going to deteriorate because of this as well. And it's the fear of the holy. That's what I want to, I just want to identify this again, which means essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, look a little more carefully at, at this episode in Shmod, and then look again in Bamidbar, and this fear of the, what is this fear of the holy cause? It causes God not to speak to them directly. What does it cause? It causes Moshe then to go up the mountain. What does that cause? It causes them to be afraid when Moshe is gone. What does that then cause? That then causes the sin of the golden calf. Now, what does that cause? That, again, you just go step after step after step without thinking about unforeseen circumstances and saying, this fear of the holy is absolutely something which is devastating and now you go to this next episode of the fear of the holy and what does it end up with? Somehow, somehow, you know, this well, Moshe, well, Moshe does die because of this. That's what I'm saying, that this is so much more interesting. Aaron is attacked there, but Aaron is going to die over there because of this continuation of the story there and once again, things are are, are, are so much more complex. The, the Bechor Shor, I think he puts his finger on it in Source 15, 
when he writes V'yikach Korach La'achar Parshat Meraglim Shenigzar Aleim Shemutu Bamidbar Lakach and, and by the way, notice what he did. He just now connected it absolutely, the story of Korach, with the story of the Moraglim and the death sentence. And he says, and look how one thing leads to the other, and to the other, to the next, and to the next, and look, at, and look how things completely deteriorate. And again, he, he, he's keeping it, his eye on this, and it's very, it's very clear to him. Now I want to go back to what I'd said before. And that is, you know, I skipped over the word, uh, the word vayatzet tzitz. Tzitz is actually something which is really interesting as well, because the tzitz itself is one of the things which is worn on the forehead of the, of the Kohen Gadol. So when his staff is put in, Right. If you take a look again now, it's source twenty. Right. So we saw we'd seen that before. If you look at the kliyakar, I mean the chizkuni said the first part of it the kli in twenty one, but the kliyakar <laughs> says it better in twenty two. The the perach refers to regular kohanim. So the tzitz relates to the tzitz of Aaron, the Kohen Gadol, and so on. So I just want to point out one more thing which we need perhaps to pay attention to. On at least one level, and I think I first pointed this out over 30 years ago, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to go back to that and say it a little broader. There is a connection between, on many levels right now, the story of Cain and Hevel and the story of Korach. The Kabbalists noted in terms of Gilgulim, Gilgulei Nishamot, and so on, right? That Moshe is Hevel and that uh, Cain is Korach. But there's something else which is interesting, is that there's an argument there on who will be the Kohen. Who will bring the Avodah, which will be accepted from God? Which means that's the original argument about a Kohen gets played out, and then it will come later on. But there's a deeper point. What's the deeper point? That the language which is used is that the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the blood of Hevel. That's the same language which is used over here, that the earth opens up its mouth and then swallows Korach, which is then seen as some kind of midrashic, midah, keneged midah, once you put the two stories together. But what's the ending of the story of Cain and Hevel. The ending is is that now now Cain, who has taken a life, who has done something, who has not recognized that Selim Elohim in his friend, he has to go into Galut. And by the way, again, something we've noted many times, midrashically, Cain and Hevel represent wool and linen. And again, you have to read the Midrashim and read the text itself, and now is not the time for it, but it's suggested by the Midrash Tanchuma that the prohibition of, of wool and linen together is because one is a farmer and one plants, one is wool and one is linen, and these two can't get together. And, uh, and it's as if kind of saying the world is okay with that Hevel. No, there needs to be separate realms. Each one is respected, and one can't be swallowed up by the other, and therefore there needs to be a, rel- a realm of wool and one of linen, and therefore each one is independent, and therefore we have a prohibition. On the other hand, who is able nonetheless to wear them together? The Kohen is able to wear them together. Why can the Kohen wear them together? Well, the Kohen, go back and just think for a moment about the Kohen who has to make the blessing. What is the blessing that he made? That, that to bless, right? Yisrael ba'ahava which means if there is love and respect and all of Am Yisrael is together, at that point you're able to wear wool and linen together. So now go back to the tzitzit. The tzitzit seems to be this little spark of a coin and this little spark of a melechet coin in v'gai kadosh, this little spark of understanding that wool and linen could or should be, be able to come together and work together to create big day kodesh, Right, that should be the case, even though most of our lives were unable to live up to that level. But what is at the very end of the story of uh, Cain and Hevel? He goes, okay, he you, you have the murder that takes place, and the, and the earth opens up, and, so, and it's the way that God describes it, swallows the blood. But then afterwards, we have something else, and that is that he is sent off into exile, and he receives an oath. 
So now the question is, what is that oat that he receives? And this right, and and there's all kinds of opinions. One of the opinions is is that he gets this that the Uva Midrash. Sorry, there's one great Midrash that Brown brings that he gets a dog, right? A dog is going to a dog is going to protect him. That he that he gets an oat of tsara'at on his forehead. By the way, tsara'at tsara'at is something which causes separateness from the Mishkan. You have to stay away from the place which is holy. You can't approach holy. You want to be the Kohen, you can't be the Kohen. So just take a look for a second right now at the very end of Rabbeinu Bachaye in source 24. He's commenting on V'yotzei Perech, V'yotzei Tzitz Moshkadim. So he says, V'tamu anu lamdim shakol ha'ma'er ala kuna kodesh baruch hu b'meredli parami menu u'motach kenegdo midad adin k'mo shematzina b'uziyahu ha'melech sheshalach yado laktir k'toret b'makom kohen v'ktiv bo v'hatsara'at zarcha b'mitzcho. Which is interesting. So midrashically what they just now did was connected this action that took place over here to Uziyahu together with what happens to Cain. Now if I just now went too quick and you kind of lost the thread over here, let me make sure that, uh, that, that we understood what just now happened. You have, the, you, you have the Kohanim and you have the pretenders. right? The first pretender is going to be Cain. And he's going to get a sign of a pretender, which is the Tzara, which is staying away from the Holy. So over here as well, Aaron's staff is going to get the actual, the tzitz is going to be there to indicate that he is the Kohen Gadol. So if we just now follow the flow all the way through, there's almost like this constant dance that takes place. And that is an attraction and then running away from holiness. It's as if this, uh, the, this, this dance takes place, that one step forward and two steps back, and we want to approach it, but we're afraid of approaching it, and then we approach it, sometimes it's inappropriate. And essentially, that, that's what happened as well. We have, it's time to enter to Eretz Yisrael, which is a Makom Kadosh, and the Miracle, no, we can't go. And then what do you have afterwards? You have the group of people who nonetheless, no, let's go. No, but now, now, now is not the time, and you're not worthy to go right now, and you have to move back. And then you have this whole complete ignoring anything of holiness, which is then the story of the, of the Mokoshesh, who then insists, no, there is holiness, and he does what he does, which our problem now is that it becomes a Malach Hashanah, it's Lagufa. What's the response to that? The response is, no, all the people still are holy. You're all on the Chakonim V'gai Kadosh. Ah, if that's the fact, then we're all Kohenim, and let's all now approach. No, you're not all Kohenim. There is still nonetheless, you all have holiness. But again, don't confuse, diff- don't, don't, confuse diff- don't confuse that you're all holy, and that you're all of like this spark of holiness with this idea that everyone is going to be the Kohen Gadol. And at that point, they keep on approaching, but then they're afraid. And at this point, we get to this point, the total fear of the holy. And I'm going to keep on saying that's what keeps taking place back and forth. As I pointed out, we already had seen this earlier. Now you can decide how early you want to go with it. You want to really go back to Cain and Hevel, Cain who doesn't see the holiness in Hevel? How do you commit murder? You don't see the holiness in another person, which means this idea of seeing holiness and not seeing holiness, ignoring holiness, embracing holiness. But part of holiness is also holiness in terms of space and holiness in terms of time and holiness in terms of action. And there needs to be this confluence of the right time, the right place, the right person, and so on. And part of holiness is that holiness comes from God. And God, therefore, makes the rules. And not everybody can say, well, I want to do something holy. And again, now you can go back to another view if you want. Well, I want to, I, you know, I want to do something. I want to do what the Kohen Gadol is supposed to do. Well, it's the wrong time. You're the wrong people. That's not the thing. Nonetheless, Aaron's going to be told to do the exact same thing that another view do. That's the right time. That's you're the right person. Which means holiness has rules to it. Holiness essentially, right, ultimately is about engaging God. Holiness is not an independent gesture. It is not about us. Holiness is about God, and it's about godliness. And therefore, once it's about godliness, God makes those rules, and he tells us when to approach, how we can approach, what we need to do to approach, and it's not just for us an eagle trip that, oh, I want to be a Kohen, and I want to do something, and I want to wear the clothing of the Kohen. No, no, all of that is different. But as I really tried to show today, there really is a flow over here. 
and the flow goes from the Meraglim to through the Makoshesh, through the Parsha of Tzitzah, which now you realize a lot of people identified, but I think I said it in a really clear way how it follows, and what did I add into it? This concept of Melechet Kohen and Vagai Kadosh, and therefore the Klayim aspect of it, which then what can you do? Once we got to Klayim, it took us back to Kain and Hevel, including Hevel running away, including Hevel have the sign on his forehead, but his sign, or his hot that he has, was the oath of not being a Kohen. It's the oath of the Tzarad. It's the oath of the distance from something which is holy. And it creates this thing which is called, no, for you, based upon you, we have shotness. There is wool and linen, you can't combine them. Oh, the real Kohen, he can combine them. Even Jews can have a spark of this and can put on the tzitzit and have the wool and linen together, but that needs to go together with this concept of love, this concept of appreciating holiness and appreciating that it's only allowed because God commanded it.